Less than a minute before the meeting began, Mark Reynolds casually walked into the room. He calmly took a seat against the back wall and turned his attention to the attractive woman standing in front. He couldn't help but notice her disdain as she glanced at him before checking her watch and calling the meeting to order. She was tall with a rather noticeable nose, but it suited her face very well. His grandmother called them big-boned. She was not overweight, but she had outstanding curves where, in Mark's opinion, a woman should have them. Mark studied the woman as she turned to point at a slide presentation on a large monitor. In his opinion, she is about 25. Her dark hair is combed into a tight bun. Mark decided that this was an attempt to appear stern and businesslike. Sandra Phillips, for her part, quickly determined that the last man to enter the meeting room was what she considered a himbo type, a sexually attractive, naive, and goofy man. He is about 1 meter 80 tall, with a strong jaw and deep blue eyes. He is dressed in a business casual style that emphasizes his strong physique. At exactly 9 o'clock in the morning, Sandra started the meeting. I am now the marketing director and sales manager for Smith & Haynes. My name is Sandra Phillips. I have available degrees in marketing and business administration. I hope we can work together to increase sales as well as improve customer satisfaction. It's no secret that knowledge of a quality product sold at a competitive price leads to success in the market. Because of this, from now on, every member of our sales team will be required to dress professionally. I see most of you have already accepted this fact. Mark couldn't help but notice that his new boss was looking right at him. Apparently, she didn't approve of his jacket and polo shirt. Men, when representing our company, you must wear a jacket and tie. Otherwise, you will not work at Smith & Haynes. Ladies must also wear appropriate business attire. There will be no exceptions. I won't talk about this today because obviously this is a new concept for some. But from now on, no one will be allowed to attend the weekly sales meeting in casual clothing. And again, I tell you that there will be no exceptions. Any questions? Mark couldn't hide his grin as the woman looked at him with obvious annoyance. Please state your name so I can make some notes on your file, she insisted. Mark realized, clearly trying to intimidate him. I don't think that's necessary, Mark replied, grinning wider. Let's just end this meeting and get to work. Everyone in the room froze in complete silence. Mark had never taken things too seriously, but now he had gone too far with his new boss. Don't you think this is necessary? The woman repeated. You know what? And I don't think your presence is necessary here. I have read the company rules. I have the right to give you a week's leave without pay, and that is exactly what I will do. You are not to appear in this building until the meeting next Monday. At this time, I will expect you to wear a jacket and tie and be prepared to apologize. Thank you, Miss Phillips, Mark said politely, leaving the room. A week later, Mark walked into the meeting room wearing cargo shorts and an Eagles t-shirt. You understand that I will not allow you to join our meeting dressed like that, Sandra Phillips said. You act like you want to get fired. I saved you the trouble, Mark replied, handing her a sealed envelope. This is my resignation letter. I already went to the HR department and filled out all the paperwork. Good luck with the company. The surprised woman tried to regain her composure. After their first meeting, she made inquiries about Mark Reynolds. He is the best salesman in the company. Its sales figures are impressive. She believed that, as soon as she got him to dress appropriately and accept her mentorship, he would become even more successful. Now he is gone. Two weeks later, Mark was lying on a trolley under an 80-year-old Alfa Romeo. He was trying to tighten up the transmission when he heard a woman coughing, trying to get his attention. Using his feet, he carefully rolled the cart out from under the classic car into the open space and was more than surprised to see Mrs. Edna Haynes, the owner of the company he had so recently left. She always treated him very fairly, and he reciprocated her feelings. It was a complete surprise to see her in her studio. Mrs. Haynes, glad to see you again. Any problems? I don't think I've ever seen you here before. It's just that there's never been a reason to visit before, Mark. I know you're busy, so I'll get straight to the point. In one week, you spoke with my new marketing director twice. 
Mark noticed that when she used the term CMO, she used air quotes with her fingers. During the first meeting, she sent you on a week-long vacation without pay. During the second meeting, a week later, you handed her your resignation letter. It occurred to me that you two didn't get along too well. Mrs. Haynes, when I started working for you many years ago, I said that I was not going to cling to your company at any cost. This young lady showed up out of the blue, said my clothing choice was inappropriate, and suspended me from work for a week. This made me realize that my time at Smith & Haynes was up. She and I will never see things the same way. She is the boss, and my decision was not difficult. It was easier for you than it was for us, said Mrs. Haynes. We're already having trouble keeping your customers. More than a few of them told me they could get the same item for less money elsewhere. It is thanks to your dedication to the terms of the contract that many of our customers have remained with us. Two days ago, I heard a story about how you drove 250 miles with a box of custom bolts when you got a panicked call from one of your clients. They forgot to order them along with other goods that we supplied. You have gone a long way to make the client happy. It's just part of my job, I guess, Mark replied. It's nice that my gesture was appreciated, but that doesn't explain why you're standing here today. I don't work for you anymore. This is exactly the problem I want to solve. I'm willing to increase your commission as well as your base salary if you agree to return to Haynes and Smith, the older woman offered. Ma'am, I left your company for two different but very compelling reasons, Mark explained. The first is that my own business is developing. This is my future, and I'm working damn hard to make it successful. The second, more obvious reason is that your new marketing director has a grudge against me. I just don't want to waste my time listening to her ramble on about how to be a better salesperson. She has two degrees and no experience in the real world. Honestly, I don't know how she managed to get this job. Mark heard a sigh from the doorway. He turned to see Sandra Phillips standing nearby. To his embarrassment, she hung on his every word. He quickly tried to soften the harshness of his words. I am confident that Miss Phillips is highly qualified and will do an excellent job for you. I'm just too stubborn and set in my ways to learn new techniques. She deserves to be surrounded by the best people who will accept her suggestions, follow her orders, and work to expand the company. You demonstrated why you are so good at sales, Mark. It was a very good way out of the crisis, Mrs. Haynes admitted with a smile. I thought you might refuse my offer, so I have a backup plan. If you agree to work with Sandy for one month and become her mentor, I am willing to compensate you much more than you take home, which is a lot. You should know that Sandy is my granddaughter, and she is the future of the company. She went a little overboard in trying to establish herself, but she now has a clearer understanding of our mission. I'm sure she'll succeed, but I don't think she'll be very receptive to my suggestions and business methods. She has two higher education degrees, and I was lucky that I at least finished high school. Mark, don't try to bullshit me. I'm the one who hired you. As far as I remember, you were fifth in class and quite popular, played on two sports teams, participated in debate club, and was student council president his senior year, Mrs. Haynes said. You said that you have a seven-year plan to create your own automobile business and that you will probably leave Smith & Haynes at that time. There are three months left before the end of the seven-year term, and I am asking for only one of them. I believe that hands-on experience will greatly enhance Sandy's understanding of her role and also allow her to better understand what her salespeople face in their jobs. When Mrs. Haynes finished speaking, Mark saw her look at her granddaughter and nod slightly. Mr. Reynolds, I'm not proud of the way I behaved during our first meeting, Sandy admitted. My grandmother explained to me how stupid I had acted and that this should not happen again. If you accept my grandmother's offer, I assure you that I will fully cooperate and try my best to adopt as much of your selling style as possible. Mark understood how difficult this apology was for her. I even felt some admiration for her. She's willing to take the hit to improve her relationship with her grandmother and... Hopefully, better understand how Smith and Haynes managed to run a successful business for over 50 years. Mrs. Haynes, Miss Phillips, I absolutely need to finish work on this car. 
I have to finish by tomorrow evening. The day after tomorrow is the first day of the month. I'll be in the office ready to work. I'll give you the month you ask for. Mark saw Mrs. Haynes nodded to her niece, after which the young woman gave him a very sweet smile. Mr. Reynolds, Grandma and I really appreciate your generosity. I assure you, I will be ready to get to work. I look forward to learning as much as I can from you. Mark looked at Sandy Phillips and looked at her grandmother. There were several questions on the tip of his tongue, but he decided not to voice them. He knew that Mrs. Haynes must have been pretty hard on her granddaughter. Sandy made a 180-degree turn from her original position. Mark didn't claim to be an expert on women, but he knew Sandra must be feeling out of place after what she perceived as defeat at his hands. How accommodating she will be remains to be seen. Two days later, Mark returned to work a few minutes early. His former colleagues gave him a warm welcome in the form of good-natured banter. Mark, I don't think I've ever seen you in a suit before. Are you here to lobby for your old job? asked Amanda Burns. Something like that, Mark answered. I was a little hasty when I left. When I started working here, I promised Mrs. Haynes that I will work for seven years. I was missing a few months. We agreed that if I stayed another month, I could leave with her blessing. So that's why you're so good at sales, Amanda said. You always keep your promises and you're a great negotiator. Customers know they can rely on you. Sandra Phillips was nearby and heard Amanda's assessment of Mark's qualities and his response. Mr. Reynolds, thank you for trying to spare my feelings, Sandra said with a slight smile. Amanda, the truth is that Mrs. Haynes was dissatisfied with my actions in connection with the sudden departure of Mr. Reynolds. He will be my mentor for the next month in hopes that I will gain a better understanding of the company's products and its customers. To this end, I plan to take you with me so that you can meet the buyers I work with and make a favorable impression on them, Mark said. With your education and physical characteristics, this should not be difficult. After Amanda left the room, Sandy decided to make sure Mark understood her position. You just mentioned my physical attributes. You must understand that I will not compromise my values for the sake of sales, no matter how significant they are. Good idea, Mark agreed. I strongly recommend that you never meet, associate with, or behave inappropriately with customers. This will not end well either for you or for the company. I'm glad you think so. I was worried that you would suggest that I use all the physical indicators, as you called them, that I have in order to make a sale, Sandy admitted. I'm afraid I still don't quite understand. There's nothing wrong with flashing your best smile, showing off your legs and a little cleavage, in a professional manner, of course. You will have to communicate with men regularly. Trust me when I say that in the world of sales, an attractive woman's smile goes a long way. And you're suggesting that I use sex for sales? Sandy asked in amazement. No, on the contrary, I say that you should not use sex for sales for any reason, ever, Mark insisted. Sexual attraction is normal, but sex in any form is not. You are an attractive woman with an enviable figure. There's nothing wrong with using this to your advantage. Sandy looked at Mark for a few seconds before answering. If this is a compliment, then you miss the mark. I have agreed to learn your sales techniques and apply what I find useful, but I will not show off my legs or breasts for the sake of sales. As a man who clearly lacks the legs and cleavage to seduce other men, how can you even make sales? If I deal with men, I use my knowledge of the product as well as my ability to win their respect and often friendship. If I sell a product to women, I do the same. Plus, I bestow them with my best smile and try to subtly appeal to their fantasy. So that's why you like wearing polo shirts? Want to use your looks and body type to influence sales in your favor? Sandy asked. Make no mistake, I never meet or associate with anyone associated with the company we do business with. But there are a few ladies who might light up a little when I walk in the door. There's nothing unethical about that, Mark replied. I understand that this can help in the sale, but the deciding factor should be the product and the price. Sandy said definitively. That's why we'll spend the next month visiting customers and learning about practical applications. 
We will constantly test and hone our sales techniques, Mark promised. It makes more sense than arguing about it now. The next month is going to be interesting. Sandy looked forward to visiting clients and building lasting business relationships. In her opinion, Mark is overconfident, but the numbers he generates indicate that he has reason to be so. She admitted to herself that he looked good and was very masculine, and she could easily imagine women falling for his charm. Mark spent the rest of the day making appointments. He decided to start with customers located within a short drive and gradually move to places where he would have to stay overnight. Sandy arrived at the company parking lot at six in the morning to find Mark already there. She readily agreed with Mark that punctuality was very important. They reached their destination almost an hour earlier. There's a nice little diner around the corner, Mark said to Sandy. You need to find out where all the good places to eat or drink coffee are near every business you deal with. Sandy spent most of the drive asking Mark about his methods and what to expect when meeting with clients. Sandy, I want you to enjoy your coffee and relax. People can sense when you're nervous and think you're trying to hide something. I chose this business because it is very reasonable and friendly. You know our product and our prices. Just listen to them and answer their questions and concerns as honestly as you can. Remember that we sell ourselves no less, if not more, than our product. We must give our customers complete confidence in our honesty and integrity. If you are unsure of the answer, admit it and explain that you will find the correct answer as soon as possible and get back to them. Never try to lie or even exaggerate, and you will succeed. I understand that and I completely agree, Sandy replied. I noticed that you didn't say anything about showing off or flirting with clients. It's obvious that you shouldn't use that trick today, Mark replied. I see your hands and face. Everything else is covered for you. Let's see how it works today. All I ask is that at least one day next week you wear something looser. You have a very good figure, and it won't hurt you to make this fact obvious. You seem confident in my figure? How do you know what kind of figure I have? You said that my choice of clothes prevents men from determining what kind of figure I have? Sandy asked. It is impossible to have both. Few men have my powers of observation when it comes to the female form, Mark replied with a grin. One of the reasons I succeed in sales is my ability to look beyond the obvious. I can often identify self-doubt and personality flaws by talking to a person for a few minutes, knowing this can make all the difference when making a sale. I have to say that this is complete nonsense, Sandy replied. You don't have any mysterious ability to know my bra size or my thigh length. By saying that I have a wonderful figure, you are using your sales techniques on me. You think flattery will soften and even change my clothing choices. But I see right through your feeble attempts. It's interesting, Mark admitted. I'm telling the truth. But you think I'm joking about your long and very slender legs. I always try to be honest, but you don't trust me. Now I have to wonder if my clients see the same thing as you. Perhaps I have a particularly effective instrument for detecting lies, and I can recognize them better than most people. Your sales success indicates that your gimmick should work most of the time, Sandy suggested. Sandy gave in to her grandmother's demands to bring Mark back and work with him because she had no choice. Grandma is very firm on this issue. In truth, Sandy expected Mark to try to use his good looks and natural charm to boost sales. She had no idea how well he understood their products and their contracts, percentages, and profit margins. He was not shy about using his charm, but at the same time remained professional in his interactions with clients. Sandy appreciated the wisdom of her grandmother's decision to travel with Mark and explore the world of sales with a master of the trade. Sandy discovered that she enjoyed meeting with clients and listening to their needs and concerns. She understood why Mark was so good at what he did. He is always polite and professional. Remain calm even when some clients lose their temper, although this is rare. Another thing Sandy noticed was the obvious interest that many of the employees showed in Mark. They absolutely respond to his smile and easy charm. Moreover, most of the men he interacts with become noticeably friendlier after just a few minutes. 
In the second week, Sandy and Mark went on a long road trip, staying in hotels instead of spending a lot of time traveling to distant businesses. The Wednesday morning of that week was decisive for her. Wow. You look great, Mark said, with obvious admiration. This image suits you very well. Thank you, Sandy replied, blushing. I decided to try your suggestion about my appearance. This is an experiment. Don't think that I will follow your example and flirt like you with women of all ages. Good idea, Mark agreed. It's much better for you to use your charms among the male half of the population. Later that day, while Mark and Sandy were having dinner at a chain restaurant, Mark asked the question Sandy had been waiting for with a small smile. Well, did you notice any difference in the way people reacted to you today? You were there with me and saw how some men looked at me and smiled like idiots. In fact, you're doing the same thing now. I admit, Mark answered, grinning. Today you managed to increase my usual sales by almost 5%. This is a lot compared to others. This is due to the fact that I showed a hint of a neckline and a skirt just above the knees. You'd think they'd never seen women before, Sandra said. They don't often see women looking as good as you, Mark replied. You chose the right style. Everyone took you seriously. The men couldn't stop smiling when they looked at you, but at the same time they listened to you. You don't want to say that I looked like a girl of easy virtue? Sandy asked with concern. The truth, Sandy, is that you are one of the most stylish women I know. You look and act like a lady. I mean that in a good way. You're not so prim and arrogant. We both know that some women consider this a sign of class. You are attractive, but attentive to others. You communicate more and more with our clients. They become more comfortable with you, and you explain our product and purchasing process better and better. It was very nice, Sandy responded feelingly. I know we didn't start off on the best foot, but I feel like we're doing much better now. You were very fair to me, considering that in the first week I got you fired. I explained my situation to you and your grandmother. I've been building my business since I left school. I have a seven-year plan to work at Smith & Haynes. I was already making plans to leave when we ran into you. I felt relieved that I could focus on my next career, Mark explained. I felt better, except for the fact that I took you away from business for a month. I hope this doesn't bother you too much. To tell you the truth, I was a little worried about how things would turn out for my old clients when I left. Now I'm starting to understand that everything will be fine with them, perhaps even better than when I worked for you, Mark said. Sandy looked forward to lunch with Mark. He always told interesting stories, listened to her thoughts, and even when he disagreed was polite with her, but quite convincing in defending his opinion. Mark, in turn, realized that he enjoyed spending time with Sandy. She has an amazing sense of humor while being refreshingly humble. Besides, he found her very attractive. My sister is studying at college in Keensburg, Sandy said to Mark at the beginning of the last week of their acquaintance. She wants to meet me on Friday. This will be the last day of our world tour. On our last night, we will stay at a hotel just ten miles from her apartment. I want to go home with her so we can catch up. I hope you don't mind. I have a brother and a sister, so I understand everything, Mark answered. Have a great trip home. The last business they planned to visit was scheduled for late Thursday evening, followed by a visit Friday morning to meet with the owner and convince him to sign the purchase agreement. Having finished work early on Friday morning, Mark hoped to make it home in time after lunch. Mark thought the meeting on Thursday afternoon had gone well, except for one very serious problem for him. The 30-year-old son of the company owner has a crush on Sandy. Mark admitted to himself that the guy was good-looking, but past experiences with him changed his opinion. He is assertive and demanding. Mark has repeatedly noticed how he humiliated employees while negotiating a sale. During the drive to the hotel, Sandy acted almost flippantly. She chatted constantly, but about almost nothing. Finally, she couldn't keep her secret. Brett invited me to dinner tonight, so don't expect me to join you. We'll just have dinner at the hotel restaurant before heading to the bar. There's a small band playing there today, so we'll probably dance. Brett is a good guy, don't you think? Sandy asked. 
although she didn't seem interested in the answer. Looks good and dresses well. We might even make more profit from his company, although that's not why I agreed to his request. He seems funny. Mark wanted to express his concerns to Sandy, but chose to remain silent. She will start working without him on Friday morning. She's in her mid-twenties, has two college degrees, and is destined to gain control of a prestigious company. What could he tell her that she shouldn't know? Mark really liked Sandy, but he felt it would be unethical to ask her out, at least not until their working relationship was in the past. Now he wondered if he had made a mistake or perhaps dodged a bullet. If Brett is the man she's looking for, then she's not the woman he thinks she is. Mark ordered dinner to his room while working on emails regarding his classic car restoration business. He was proud of the success of his business. I started it right after finishing school. Now he is going to devote all his time and energy to his business. His time at Smith & Haynes had finally come to an end. Just after 11 p.m., Mark decided that was all for today and went to bed. He had just fallen into a deep sleep when a loud knock on the hotel room door woke him from his slumber. Mark tried to shake the fog from his brain, got out of bed, and shuffled towards the door. As soon as he turned the knob, Sandy swung the door open and rushed inside, dragging her suitcase behind her. She slammed the door and turned to Mark with tears in her eyes. This asshole decided it was easy to sleep with me. He insisted on showing me to my room after dinner and a few dances. He took my room key to open the door and never gave it back. He started pestering me without my consent. I asked him to get some ice for the bottle of alcohol he found in the minibar before we started. As soon as he was out of sight in search of the ice maker, I grabbed my phone and suitcase and rushed across the hall. He has my key, so I'll stay with you for the night if you don't mind. Finally, Sandy seemed to notice that Mark was standing in front of her in only his boxers. She slowly ran her eyes over his chest and lower body. You probably sleep in your underwear. I guess I should be grateful that you're wearing so much. I knew you were a strong man, but you are in better shape than I imagined. I need to write to my sister about tomorrow, so don't pay any attention to me. Sleep, or whatever you were doing when I knocked on your door. Mark was already fully awake, but, looking at the clock standing by his bed, he realized that it was already past midnight. He had a long drive ahead of him the next day, and he didn't think there was any benefit in running into Brett. He's probably on edge and a little annoyed that he didn't get sex. You can stay here, but I won't give up the bed for you, Mark answered. I told you that dating any of our clients is a bad idea. Brett, an absolute asshole. You should have noticed this before he even managed to get into your room. I'm going back to bed, so whatever you do, please do it quietly. Mark was still mad at Sandy for getting involved with such a jerk as Brett. He was glad that she managed to escape from him, but was unhappy with her decision to go on a date with him. Mark realized he needed to step back and honestly evaluate his feelings before he said too much to Sandy. Surprisingly, he soon fell asleep again, woke up in the middle of the night to find Sandy sleeping next to him. Her head rests on his arm and her left leg is thrown over his legs. She's wearing one of his t-shirts, which she must have pulled out of her suitcase. Looking at her, Mark realized that she could wear any of his t-shirts at any time. Very little time passed, and Mark was awakened again by a loud knock on the door. Swearing under his breath, he promised that if it was the same asshole Brett, then he would personally kick his ass. And again the door swung open as soon as he turned the handle. To his surprise, a pretty young woman entered the room. She quickly looked him up and down and, muttering something under her breath, began to look around the room. At that moment, Sandy rolled over onto her back and opened her eyes. Sarah, why are you here in the middle of the night? Something happened? Little sister, did you sleep with this guy? Did he force you to do this? Should I call the police? The girl, whom Mark now identified as Sandy's sister, demanded. Mark? He will never harm me. He's one of the good guys, Sandy replied. Why are you here at this time? Sandy, it's almost eight in the morning. You wrote that before your meeting today we should go to breakfast, 
but you didn't mention that you would sleep with this guy. Is this the guy you work with? Is having an affair at work a good idea? Asked Sarah. I'm not sleeping with Mark, Sandy insisted. Well, I probably slept with him, but that's all we did. They just slept next to each other. That's all. Whatever you say, but it's hard to believe when the guy looks so good, Sarah argued. What happened to that asshole who attacked you last night? By this time, Mark was fully awake. Once again, the sisters continued to chat in his bedroom. He closed the bathroom door and began to take a shower. Sandy, why would you go on a date with a bully if you have such a handsome guy like Mark at your disposal? Sarah asked when they were alone. Sometimes I don't understand what you're thinking about. To be honest, me too, Sandy replied. I was hoping Mark would tell me to forget Brett and ask me to date him. You're right, he's good looking. But I can't get him to think of me as a desirable woman. I can't stand my big nose. Maybe I need to fix it. You always said that you were proud of the way you looked and that any man interested in you would love you for who you are. Did he say anything about your nose or the way you look? Actually, he always tells me that I'm attractive. He just doesn't pretend to believe it. He does a great job at work, but he doesn't seem to be interested in much on a personal level, Sandy complained. Sis, when he opened the door, he was clearly very excited. I can't say whether this is your fault, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Maybe he is shy, or maybe he doesn't want to meet a woman at work. What is this? A bruise? Sarah suddenly asked, looking at her sister's cleavage. Where? Oh, shit, Sandy stated, looking at the T-shirt she was wearing. I told you that this idiot was mean to me, but I didn't tell you how much damage he did to me. I didn't want you to worry. Having entered my room last evening, uninvited, he began to rudely pester me. He was drunk and said all sorts of stupid things about how he liked it rough and that I would learn to like it too. I had to use all my sales techniques to get him to go get the ice. As I said in my message, he still had the key to my room, so I grabbed my suitcase and phone and hurried here to Mark's room. This guy hurt me, and I was afraid he wouldn't take no for an answer. Did Brett pester you so much that you got bruises? Mark demanded. Sarah and Sandy were surprised to find Mark standing behind them, wearing only a towel wrapped around his chest. The expression on his face was something Sandy had never seen on him before. He was beside himself with rage. Seeing how upset he was, Sandy immediately responded, Yes, I didn't encourage him or give him any permission to touch me, Mark. Mark seemed to consider her words before making his request. I don't want to embarrass you, Sandy, but can I look at the bruises? If Sandy was surprised by the request, then her sister was simply stunned when Sandy nodded and pulled top t-shirt down so much that her left breast was exposed. It never occurred to Sandy to refuse Mark. She watched the intensity of his emotions play across his face. It was obvious that he was very upset. She couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement mixed with worry as he examined her breasts so intently. Sarah, please take some photos of these bruises on Sandy's phone, Mark asked, finally taking his eyes off Sandy's torso. I don't know how everything will work out, but they may be needed. Be sure to take some clear photos. It is obvious that the bruises were caused by a large hand. He'll be damn sorry he did that to your sister. I guarantee it. Mark was still upset when he opened his suitcase and pulled out clean boxers. Throwing off the towel and putting on his underpants, he muttered something to himself. Sarah's sigh brought his attention back to his surroundings. I forgot where I was for a minute. More precisely, I knew where I was, but I forgot that there were ladies here, Mark clarified. I think about this worthless asshole and how the father allows his son liberties at work. Looking back on some of the things I've seen and heard over the years, I know I had to do something. At the very least, I should have ended our business partnership. Sandy, you won't go to work today. Have a good breakfast with your sister and go home calmly. I'll take care of things here. Just relax and enjoy your time with Sarah. What will you do? If we're not careful, we'll lose their business completely. They buy a lot of our products, Sandy said nervously. Sandy, they should be worried about losing our business. 
Smith and Haynes shouldn't deal with scum like that. I will fire them as our client. I'll call your grandmother and explain everything to her. I'm sure she will approve. We will not do business with any company that treats people the way Brett treated you. You're probably right, Sandy admitted. Be careful if you see Brett. He's quite big and bragged about what a great football player he was in school. I have no doubt, Mark answered with a sad smile. If you don't have feelings for him, I plan to give him some fresh bruises. I'll see how much he likes it. I don't care about him, Mark. I just don't want you to get hurt or in trouble because I was stupid enough to spend time with that idiot, Sandy said. Sarah, be sure to take a photo of the bruises. After that, take your sister to breakfast. I'll sort it all out here. Today is the last day of the month that you promised my grandmother. I learned a lot traveling with you, Mark, Sandy said, walking up to Mark and hugging him. If you ever want to come back to Smith & Haynes, there's a job for you. I guarantee it. Good luck to you in your growing business. Sis, you could have waited until he got dressed again before you hugged him. However, if you think about it, the game was very good, Sarah said with a grin, looking at Mark's naked torso. By the middle of the next month, Sandy had established herself as a competent sales manager and was increasingly comfortable in her role as a marketer. She hasn't spoken to Mark since the day he told her to go home with Sarah. This fact disappointed Sandy. She thought they got along well. She even hoped that Mark would show romantic interest in her, especially after the story her grandmother told her the following Monday. Sandy, I talked to Mark for a long time about your month under his leadership. The first thing he mentioned was how and why he broke off our relationship with Gaston and Son. He told me about young Gaston's extremely inappropriate behavior and how this was the last straw for Mark. He told Ben Gaston in no uncertain terms that his son Brett, a worthless non-entity, and that he will no longer deal with people of his circle. Mark said he was going to do it. I thought you would understand his decision, Sandy replied. Will this become a problem now? As far as I understand, no. Ben Gaston called me in anger the same day Mark ended our business relationship with them. So they needed our product that much? Sandy asked in surprise. Hardly. He wanted me to fire Mark. It seems Mark said some nasty things to Brett and also to Ben. Mark had almost reached his car when Brett caught up with him in the company parking lot. The police have video footage from surveillance cameras. Brett hit Mark. Oh, no. I warned Mark that Brett was a big guy and quite tough. Was he hurt? Sandy asked. Yes, he spent the night in the hospital, but he is expected to make a full recovery. After police asked several questions and reviewed surveillance video, Mark was not charged with any crime. It was obvious self-defense, Sandy's grandmother replied slyly, as Sandy cried out in surprise. Grandma, are you saying that... Mark kicked his ass. Mrs. Haynes replied with a wide grin. You made a very good impression on Mark. He admitted that he wasn't disappointed when Brett attacked him. He was very angry that this idiot treated you like that. Is there anything happening between you and Mark by any chance? I haven't talked to him since Friday, but to be honest, I wouldn't mind getting to know him better. Sandy told her grandmother. He doesn't work for us anymore, so it shouldn't be a problem, right? Darling... If he suits you, don't worry about trifles. You're right. Since he doesn't work for us, then everything is fine. Honestly, I would never pass up the opportunity to date a man like Mark for any other reason than our feelings for each other. Sandy thought about contacting Mark, but couldn't think of any good reason to do so. If he had been even slightly interested, he would have called her or stopped by her work. Three weeks later, Sandy and her family attended the wedding of one of her cousins. Grandma Sandy is one of four sisters. Her three sisters each had several children, and now her sister's granddaughters were growing up and finding spouses. Sandy has 12 second cousins, and they were all attractive. Sandy spent a lot of time with them while they were growing up. They got along with each other like sisters. As the girls moved on to high school and college, Sandy began to feel left out of their conversations which mostly focused on boys. Sandy considered herself the least attractive cousin. While others told stories of dating and romance, Sandy contributed very little to them. Her cousins noticed this. At school, Sandy was focused on her studies and did very well. 
but she never had anything resembling a serious relationship. Sarah insisted that Sandy's lack of suitors was due to her strong and unyielding character, convinced Sandy to be less demanding and critical. Guys just don't like girls who are bossy and pushy. Although Sandy recognized that Sarah was right, she was unwilling to accept mediocrity in herself and others. This attitude goes a long way toward explaining why she so often stays home on weekends while her friends and cousins go out on dates. Now another cousin is getting married. Sandy had been to these weddings often enough to know how it would work. First, all the girls will introduce their grooms. Eventually, Sandy will be asked if she has anyone, even though all of her cousins know about her dismal dating history. Sandy will be the center of several awkward minutes as the girls list the names of possible suitors and the reasons why they might be suitable for her. Eventually, the conversation will move on to less painful topics. At the reception, Sandy felt like she was experiencing deja vu again. Her cousin, Angela. Angela had just married a handsome, athletic guy, and all her cousins agreed that she had managed to find herself a good husband. Sandy, did you come with your significant other today? Marie asked loudly enough for the other women to pay attention to her. Well, with my new position at Smith & Haynes, I didn't have time for that. Grandma expects me to learn the business well enough to replace her. Don't you have time for dates? Have you met any interesting men since Brianna's wedding last spring? Marie pressed. Not really, Sandy began, but Sarah interrupted her. I would say that Mark is a very interesting man. Sis doesn't talk about it often, but she spent a month learning sales with a real handsome guy. Sandy loves her sister for trying to improve her position in society, but she worries about the inevitable questions she will be asked. Yokas aside, cousin Charity joined in. Romance at work? Is it still going on? And what does this guy look like? Well, he, Sandy managed to say, before Sarah revealed the shocking information. He's coming through the door right now, Sarah purred, looking at the entrance. Mark smiled and shook hands with the groom, who stood at the entrance and greeted the guests. It was obvious that the two men were good friends from the way they slapped each other on the back and laughed. Oh, wow, Marie exclaimed. He's very good looking, Sandy. You're going to introduce us to your boyfriend, aren't you? Sandy stared at Sarah, trying to find a reasonable answer to Marie's question. Why did Sarah make it sound like she and Mark were dating? Now she found herself in the most awkward situation. Sarah saw Sandy grimace and decided to try to make the best of the situation. I don't think Mark has seen Sandy yet. I'll go get him and bring him so everyone can meet him. He's a great guy. Sarah saw Sandy's face turn crimson at her words. Sarah knew Mark only briefly, but she was confident that he would be a gentleman and help Sandy get out of the situation that Sarah had created. Mark was chatting with his friend Lance when he recognized Sarah approaching him. His smile grew even brighter as he hugged her. Sarah, didn't know you were here today. Are you friends with Angela? Is Sandy here too? Yes, Sandy is here and she needs your help. I kind of told all our cousins that she was working with a real hot guy when they asked if she was seeing anyone. I created the impression that you liked each other, and all the girls want to get to know you. Sandy is scared to death that she will be seen as a desperate woman, and it will be my fault, Sarah explained quickly, leading Mark to the assembled cousins. Could you please be really nice to her? It would mean a lot to Sandy, and keep me out of her favor. Mark digested everything Sarah told him as he led her across the room. I love it when people ask me for a favor. Don't worry, I'll do everything. Sandy stood frozen in place as she watched Sarah and Mark approach her. She didn't know what to say, what to do, or how to get out of this situation. Mark beamed as he moved closer to Sandy, put his arm around her shoulders, pulled her towards him, and said loudly, I'm so glad to see you again, Sandy. Holding her to his chest, he whispered in her ear, May I kiss you? You do not mind. When he released her from his embrace, Sandy looked questioningly into his eyes. Seeing what she was looking for, she kissed Mark. He didn't need any further encouragement as he pulled Sandy to his chest again. Sandy lost track of time as she was completely controlled by her emotions. 
She felt relieved that Mark had asked to kiss her, that she was in his arms, and that he didn't care who saw them. She didn't want this moment to end. Sister, you made a little scandal here, Sarah said to her sister quietly, but loud enough for the others to hear. Oh, Grandma will come now. You better let the guy go and find out what she wants. Sandy's face became flushed and bright as she walked away from Mark to greet her grandmother. As she regained control of her emotions, she wondered if there would be a problem. To her surprise, Grandma Haynes moved closer to Mark and leaned in to kiss his cheek. She took his hand in hers, turning to Sandy with a bright smile. Your mom and dad were wondering who this young man was who hugged you and greeted you so warmly, Mrs. Haynes said. I assured them that he was a wonderful man and offered to introduce them to him. Your mother is dying of curiosity. Let's go to her and solve this problem. Sandy didn't even think that her parents and grandmother would be at the reception when she found herself in Mark's arms. She had never done anything even close to kissing a man passionately in front of them. Hell, even a warm handshake with a man would surprise them. Grandma, let me introduce him, please, Sandy insisted, leading Mark to his parents. Mother, father, this is Mark Reynolds, the man I told you about when I first came to work at Smith & Haynes, Sandy managed. Mark, these are my parents, William and Janet Phillips. Mark smiled and extended his hand to Sandy's mother, but she did not accept it, but walked around his hand and hugged him warmly. If Sandy can kiss you like that, then her mom can definitely hug you, Janet said. Well, aren't you strong? Have I already said that I am very pleased to meet you? Sandy felt a little embarrassed by her mother's warm greeting. She tried to remember her mother ever being so warm towards the boy Sandy had introduced her to when she realized that Mark was the first guy she had brought to meet her parents. William Phillips was less impressed. He shook Mark's hand but felt the need to rebuke him. I don't care much for public displays of affection, Mr. Reynolds. I expect you to treat my daughter with respect. Mark immediately realized that William was a bit of a troublemaker. Mr. Phillips, you of course have the right to your opinion. I accept it. But that doesn't change the fact that whenever your beautiful daughter is ready to give me a hug or a kiss, she will get it. William Phillips turned red and began to puff. Sarah noticed this and quickly tried to defuse the situation. I assume you're talking about me, Mark. I'm ready for any hugs and kisses from you, Sarah joked, hugging Mark. Actually, I meant the other beautiful daughter, Phillips Saru, Mark answered with a grin. However, if Sandy doesn't mind, I'll be glad. Don't even think about it, kid, Sandy interrupted, but she smiled widely. Mark, would you mind walking with me to meet my other relatives, especially the coven of witches that are standing at the bar and looking at us? Once away from her parents, Sandy stopped and turned to Mark. What happened just now? Was it Sarah who asked you to save me from an awkward situation? Were you just being a gentleman? Why did you kiss me like that? Sarah did tell me that she kind of put you in a difficult situation and asked you to help, Mark admitted. When the smile left Sandy's face, he carefully placed his hands on her shoulders and pulled her towards him. He lifted her face to his. Sandy, this was like a dream come true for me. Sarah didn't have to twist my arms. You are a beautiful woman, and I really enjoy being with you. I'm not pretending. I hope you do too. Sandy smiled and kissed him tenderly. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Didn't mean for it to be some kind of mercy sex. Sorry for my French. I like being with you, but only if you want the same. I would like to get to know you better. Are you friends with the groom? Had no idea you'd be here today? I played baseball with Lance in high school. One summer, we rented a room together as a team on the road. We became good friends with him. I didn't know Angela was your cousin until I found out a few minutes ago. Sandy beamed as she introduced Mark to her many cousins and relatives. She could see that they were impressed by his appearance and behavior. Mark has said more than once that a good salesman should only sell one thing. This is yourself. If this succeeds, everything else falls into place. Mark is charming, with a sense of humor, and attentive to all members of her large family. They reacted to this with obvious approval. According to family custom, 
The tables were arranged so that the cousins sat at several adjacent tables. As adults, they drank a few glasses and began telling each other stories. This was usually one of those times where Sandy would listen but not participate. She never felt like she had anything interesting to offer. Mark was asked how he met Sandy. He embellished it a little, telling how, within minutes of meeting him, Sandy sent him home without pay. And at the second meeting, I fired her. Sandy laughed along with everyone else, realizing that this was quite a funny story. Sis, tell everyone about how you slept with Mark, purred a slightly intoxicated Sarah. Great story. All attention immediately turned to the blushing Sandy. Thank you very much, Sarah. You just made it clear to everyone that Mark and I are lovers. Is it really that terrible? Marcy teased. From my point of view, there is nothing wrong with this. Now I just have to talk about it. Your fantasies will be much worse than the real event, Sandy argued. This was at the end of my work with Mark as my mentor. I already told you how my grandmother insisted that I learn about sales from an expert. As usual, she was right. I learned a lot. The son of the owner of one of our largest clients flirted with me. To be honest, I was hoping to make Mark a little jealous and agreed to meet the guy for dinner at our hotel and then go dancing at a club. Foolishly, I decided that Mark would insist on his own and stop me. It was he who pointed out that you can flirt a little with clients to increase sales, but under no circumstances should you date them, sleep with them, or have anything other than a business relationship. Mark did not express the slightest protest. I think he went to his room before my boyfriend and I even had dinner. We had a little too much at dinner. After that, we went to the bar and danced and had some more drinks. I started to worry about how much I had drunk, so I told him I had enough for today and went to my room. So, how did it happen that you slept with Mark when you were at a party with another guy? Asked Marie. This idiot insisted on walking me to my room. When I pulled out my key card to get in, he snatched it from my hand, opened the door, and followed me in, Sandy said. I was wearing a dress with a small neckline. That bastard locked the door. Then he turned to me and began to pester me very rudely. I held back my tears and told him that he needed some ice to go with the alcohol from the minibar. He grumbled slightly, but went off to get some ice. He took the key to my room with him. I stuffed the clothes that were lying on the bed into my suitcase, grabbed my phone, walked across the hall, and knocked on Mark's door. By then, it was already close to midnight. Mark added, I sleep pretty soundly, so it took me a few seconds to wake up. I staggered to the door and opened it to see who was knocking on my door in the middle of the night. Sandy pushed past me, closed the door, and locked it. I told him that Brett, that was the guy's name, treated me rudely, and I want to spend the night in his room as soon as I text Sarah to meet me the next morning in Mark's room, not mine. I decided that Sandy was complaining because the guy seemed to have let his hands go. I can understand when a guy tries to do that. As you all can see, Sandy looks damn good, Mark added. Mark sleeps in his shorts. By the time I texted Sarah, he was already asleep. I found one of his t-shirts, put it on and went to bed. I was wearing panties, so don't think I was up to anything. The next morning, Sarah came to the room. She noticed part of the bruise above the neckline of Mark's T-shirt that I was wearing. I confirm, Sarah emphasized. When I knocked the next morning, Mark answered the door. He was only wearing shorts, and his muscles were visible. I finally looked over and saw Sandy in his bed. You can imagine what I thought about what happened. Sandy assured me that what I thought did not happen. This made me question my older sister's sanity. While we were talking... Mark went into the bathroom to take a shower. I noticed a bruise on Sandy and asked about it. She looked down and was surprised at how bright it was. Sandy told me how a guy hurt her. We didn't hear Mark come back into the room until he suddenly appeared there in a towel and angry as hell. He was quite intimidating and asked Sandy if she would show him the bruise. I couldn't believe it when she just reached up and pulled her shirt off, so her breasts were exposed. Wait! Sandy showed him her breasts just because he asked, asked Marie. Sandy, why did you show him your breasts if you're not dating or anything? I asked myself the same question, Sandy admitted. 
He was so focused and so concerned that it never occurred to me to refuse. He seemed to be on a mission, and it seemed to me that this was how it should be. Wow, that's a story, Marcy stated, looking at Mark to see his reaction. I have to apologize to Sandy for behaving inappropriately. I didn't think well when I heard what a big bruise that asshole gave her, Mark admitted. Yes, he got so angry that he dropped the towel in front of my sister and me as if we weren't there. He muttered curses while pulling on clean underpants, Sarah added. This is getting more and more interesting, said Marie. Have both sisters seen this guy naked? He was so angry that he didn't care if you both ended up with scars on your face. That's it, is for life. Great story. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about how Mark beat the crap out of a guy and sent him to the hospital after telling his dad that his business wasn't needed or wanted by Smith and Haynes. Sandy added sarcastically. Not a damn thing, Marie purred. I think it's very sexy when a man protects his woman. The guy got what he deserved, and Mark gave him a slap on the wrist. Well done, Mark. Sandy listened to others talk about their experiences. She was surprised that she was neither ashamed or embarrassed for her actions. No one is outraged that she showed Mark the bruises on her chest. She is not criticized for sleeping in his bed. Everyone acted as if it was all completely natural, but Sandy felt like she was sharing something special with Mark. This was completely unusual for her, but for some reason it seemed right. Eventually, the reception began to wind down, and everyone began to say goodbye and tell them what a great time they had. Almost all of Sandy's relatives told her what a wonderful boyfriend she had. This made her happy, but also made her wonder if she really had this guy. Mom and Dad are ready to leave. Sarah and I are going with them, so we should go too, Sandy told Mark. Dad is still sulking because you didn't repent when he made the comment about us kissing in public. Mom and Grandmother consider you what they need, just like that. Whatever the reason you were so kind to me today, I am grateful to you. I had a great time. Can I give you a ride home? Mark asked. Tell Daddy that we'll kiss in private so he doesn't worry. It would be great. I'll tell them to go without me. You will take me home. Mark watched Sandy talk to the family. Her mother and Mrs. Haynes looked in his direction and smiled. Sarah waved at him, and William Phillips frowned and headed out. Everyone except my father thought it was a good idea to go with you, Sandy told Mark when she returned. Yeah, he looked like a cat just pooped in his cereal, Mark replied with a grin. Mark began to tell Sandy stories about his youth and family. When they worked together, he never told her about personal things. When they arrived at Sandy's house, she turned to him and kissed him on the cheek. Tomorrow I'm leaving for Hawaii for business and pleasure. I would like to meet with a few people interested in restoring their cars. Fun is when I spend time with my brother Jeff. He is a Marine, and he has free time. He flies in from Okinawa. Is it okay if I call, text, and email? Mark asked Sandy. I'm embarrassed about this trip. Now I know it's not me you're upset about. I haven't contacted you since we worked together because I realized that my behavior that morning in the hotel room was pretty bad. I'm not proud of him. Mark, I feel much closer to you now that I know more about your life before we met. You have a wonderful family. I'm sorry that my father turned out to be such an ass to you, but I'm very pleased that both your mother and grandmother really like you. Sarah thinks you're hot, but she's seen you naked so that's understandable. That wasn't my best moment, Sandy. I have a bad habit of ignoring everything around me when I'm angry or very stressed. All I can think about is the problem in front of me. This was completely inappropriate. I probably looked like a real asshole. Let me apologize to you again. Sarah was very impressed. To be honest, me too. It was completely inappropriate but the fact that I bared my breasts in front of you was also not the height of good taste. Maybe we're closet exhibitionists, Sandy suggested. You're so beautiful, so I understand why you're proud to be looked at, Mark said. Personally, you take my breath away. Well, now you've gone overboard, Sandy replied. I know what I look like. I will never look like a supermodel. My ass is too big and my nose looks like a potato. 
Mark chuckled at this remark. Potatoes? You have a strong nose, and it gives you character. The condition of your ass is not even discussed. You look like a real woman, not some anorexic blonde. Mark walked Sandy to her door. She stopped and looked at him with a sparkle in her eyes. That was enough, and he pulled her into his arms and kissed her. I'll drive you crazy with texts and emails, Mark promised. I'll call you about when we can agree on a suitable time, taking into account our obligations and the time difference. I'll find time, Sandy promised. I'll be looking forward to your call. Sandy eagerly awaited the text messages and photos that Mark sent to her phone. It's no surprise that Hawaii is a beautiful place. Sandy especially loved the views from Mark's hotel balcony. He had photographs of the beach and the ocean beyond. Sandy decided that someday in the near future, she would definitely visit the Hawaiian islands. Naturally, on the day that Mark was supposed to return home, Sandy had to go spend the night with one of her company's best clients. She hoped to see him sooner, but this was not expected. It's good that he understands what her job is. Mark told Sandy he had a meeting with clients the next evening, so she stopped at a local grill for happy hour and a blackened fish sandwich. Shortly after Sandy sat down at the table, an extremely attractive blonde about her age sat down at the table next to her. Soon, the blonde was joined by several other young women. Sandy didn't try to eavesdrop, but the group of women at the next table made no attempt to stop it. How was Hawaii, Brittany? Did you have a good time? Your tan looks incredible, the red-haired woman asked the attractive blonde. I didn't see as much as you think, answered the woman Sandy now knew as Brittany. For some reason, I spent a lot of time in bed. Maybe the reason is the tall, dark-haired, handsome man, asked the ash brunette. Perhaps it could have something to do with it, Brittany replied with a bright smile. This man is on fire. However, from our bed I watched the ships on the ocean, so I think I was able to take in some of the sights. You really fell in love with this guy, didn't you? At school you thought he was a jerk, the redhead noted. What changed your opinion about him? He was a skinny boy who talked about cars all the time. Quite boring. Physically, he was not impressive. Last Christmas, I ran into him at the mall and he remembered me. I couldn't believe it was the same guy. He's filled in the right places and he's a great conversationalist. I think those ten days in Hawaii convinced him that I was the girl he dreamed of. You mean you can marry him? Both women asked at the same time. I just want to say that there is a real chance that he will ask me an important question in the near future, and my answer will be yes, if and when he does. Brittany Reynolds sounds good, don't you think? Sandy was so upset that she had to leave before everyone saw her cry. She threw a 50 kopeck piece on the table and hurried out of the restaurant. Later that evening, Mark called her, but she let the call go to voicemail. After thinking about the situation, she decided to block his number. Any normal person would be able to pick up on a subtle hint that she doesn't want to talk to him. Sandy has no intention of becoming one of the women in Mark's stable. He flew to Hawaii with a blonde who looked like a supermodel. She knew she could never compete with women like her. The disrespect he showed was simply stunning. As Sandy predicted, it didn't take long for Mark to realize that Sandy wanted nothing to do with him. A week after Sandy cut him off, Mark wrote to Sarah on social media and asked if she could tell him why Sandy turned her back on him. Sarah responded that evening. Her explanation was very vague. She told Mark that Sandy was not his girlfriend and he should leave her alone. Mark tried to ask Sarah for her answer, but found himself blocked by Sarah as well. Things got more complicated between Thanksgiving and Christmas. A severe winter snowstorm was forecast to hit the northeast, and the amount of snow measured meters, not centimeters. According to forecasts, the temperature was expected to drop to minus 13 to 17 degrees with gusty winds. Mark kept a close eye on the weather reports and did everything he could to prepare for the loss of power and possibly communications. Telephone lines and even cell towers were expected to take significant damage from the storm. Mark's phone vibrated in his pocket. He was stunned to see Sandy's number on the ID. Mark, I know I have no right to ask you for help, but Sarah could be in danger. Before the hurricane hit, she was supposed to be driving home from college, but between Henderson and Hastings. Corners, she had a flat tier. Finale, 
A truck driver stopped and helped her change the tear, but she lost a whole hour, and by that time it was snowing heavily. She called her mom when she got back on the road. We expected her to return in a couple of hours, even taking into account the bad road conditions. I have a four-wheel drive car and decided to look for her by driving along the route she was supposed to take to get home. I only got to the donut shop in Blairstown. My car can't drive through such deep snow. Now I'm stuck here. Due to bad weather, nothing works. We haven't heard from Sarah since she spoke to her mom a few hours ago. Her phone goes to voicemail. Sandy, I'll be there in half an hour. Stay in the car, don't turn off the engine, and don't turn off the heater, Mark promised without asking her questions. Sandy felt instant relief when Mark responded so positively to her request. He could have easily brushed her off. The emergency alert system warned against any travel. The weather was listed as life-threatening, but Mark didn't ask questions or throw insults. He just said that he would come to her. When she realized the difficult situation she was in, Mark immediately came to mind. There were no other options. She knew that, despite the problems between them, he would do everything possible for her and Sarah. Twenty minutes passed when a large pickup truck pulled into the parking lot next to her. The front bumper, which Sandy thought was quite high off the ground, was pushing snow. By the time Sandy turned off the car, Mark was already opening her door. Lock her up and get in my truck, Mark insisted. This is the strongest storm in recent decades. We have to find Sarah, or at least make sure she's safe. I was thinking about what route she could take to get home. My concern is that she might have tried to take a shortcut through Warren Road. This is a secondary road and is always the last to be cleared. The houses are far apart, and there are several sharp turns with no guardrails. We always take this road when we go to or from college, Sandy said. She could get stuck on the road, or worse, drive off the road and get stuck. I'm very worried about her. We won't stop searching until we're sure she's safe, Mark promised. I have all kinds of gear and equipment in this truck. We are as prepared as possible. It took half an hour to get to Warren Road. Sandy thought Mark was driving painfully slowly, but she was sure he knew what was best. Snow slid onto the hood and fell off the sides, but the big truck kept moving. Ten minutes later, Mark suddenly stopped the car and drove a short distance. Sandy looked around. She saw nothing but white. What's the matter, Mark? Do you see something? The snow on the side of the road looks too small compared to everything else. I think something must have cleared this place long before the snow started falling. Wait here while I go and have a look. After leaving the road and finding a steep descent, Mark found Sandy next to him. Look, in that ravine is Sarah's car, Sandy shouted, running away as quickly as the deep snow allowed. Somehow, Mark managed to get to the wrecked car before Sandy. The driver's door was jammed by a tree, so he walked around the front of the car. The door would not open because the gear selector was in the park position. He explained to Sandy that he had a tool in his truck to safely break the window and hurried away. Sandy tried to look inside through the tinted window, but couldn't see anything. What she saw greatly disturbed her. Sarah seemed to slump over the steering wheel. Suddenly, Mark was next to her again. In his hands, he had a small tool with which he broke the window glass. Mark carefully poured the glass onto the floor near the passenger seat. Then he climbed inside and unlocked the door. Sandy jerked the door open, hearing the sound of the lock opening. She crawled over to Sarah, who remained motionless. She spent less than a minute assessing her sister's condition. She is alive, but unconscious. She is hypothermic and has a small bump on her head. Under normal circumstances, it would not be a good idea to move an accident victim, but he will freeze to death if we don't warm him up. We must risk further injury to save her, Sandy said calmly. I'll help in any way I can, but you'll have to do most of the carrying of her up the steep hill to the truck. It won't be easy, but we need to keep her warm. It took a lot of effort for Mark, but within twenty minutes he was carefully placing Sarah in his truck, with the heater running at full blast. Sandy asked him to put Sarah in her lap instead of in the back seat. I want to hold her close and try to warm her up. How long will it take to get to the hospital? I don't want to tell you, but I don't know if we'll have time to get there. 
I can barely see the tracks I left half an hour ago when I was driving here, Mark answered. I think it would be best for us to be at my house. It's much closer than your parents' house. The hospital will take another hour if we get there. Whatever you say, Mark, I trust your knowledge in this matter. Try to get us there safe and sound so we can take care of her, please. A little over 40 agonizing minutes later, Mark drove the large truck into the spacious garage. In less than a minute, he delivered Sarah to his home. On the way to the house, Sandy was able to contact her mother and tell her that Sarah had been found and that they would do everything possible to take care of her. Sandy assured her mother that Sarah would get better soon. Where is your bathroom? Do you have a bath? Sandy asked. I want to get her out of these wet clothes as soon as possible and put her in a warm bath. Come after me. I'll take her to my bedroom. The master bathroom has a large jacuzzi tub. I'll start filling it with hot water while you take care of Sarah. Mark carefully placed Sarah on his double bed and hurried to the bathroom to get some water, while Sandy began to carefully undress Sarah. Mark, take her to the bath, Sandy instructed. She breathes evenly, but her breathing is shallow. Try to carefully lower it into the water. I will go in with her so that she does not drown. Mark carefully lifted the beautiful naked woman from the bed and carried her to the bathroom. By the time he was ready to put Sarah down, an equally naked Sandy entered the tub and sat down, raising her arms to receive her sister. Once both women were settled, Mark began to relax. Sweat was dripping from his nose. This made him think that he was thoroughly wet. He unbuttoned his heavy jacket and threw it on the floor. He began to peel off layers of clothing until he was left in only boxers, fitting him like a second skin. He grabbed a bath towel and stepped into the shower stall. Five minutes later, I came out in a towel and felt much better. Sarah is moving, Sandy called from the bathtub. Please bring me some small towels and napkins for washing. Could you lower the water temperature a little? It's getting hot here. Now that Mark had freshened up after his shower and had time to relax a little, he was acutely aware that two beautiful sisters were sitting naked in his bathroom. He tried to avert his eyes while he fiddled with the temperature control. For God's sake, Mark, you brought Sarah here naked and handed her to me while I was naked. You don't have to pretend that you didn't see us or that we'll be offended if you see us again. I think you saved Sarah's life. We definitely won't be upset if you get a few extra looks. Mark put on his shorts and pulled a chair towards the bathtub. He sat down and watched as Sandy used a warm, damp cloth to wipe down the parts of Sarah's body that weren't submerged in the warm water. He jumped up and brought whatever Sandy told him. Sarah began to move more and finally looked around with clear awareness. It took several tries, but finally she spoke, focusing her gaze on Mark. What's happened? How did I get here? Where's Sandy? I'm the one who strokes your shoulders and coos in your ear, Sandy answered with a smile. How are you feeling? We have been very worried about you for some time. My head seems to be hurt and hurt, Sarah answered slowly. I remember that I was cold. Then I didn't feel anything. I thought I was dying. And for some reason, I came to terms with it. How did I get here? Where am I? We're at Mark's house, Sandy answered. He picked me up in his big truck so we could look for you. I saw where you slipped off the road. He carried you up a steep embankment through half a meter or a meter of snow to his truck. The roads are so bad that we decided to stop here and warm you up. This warm water is just a wonderful feeling, Sarah admitted. I don't have any clothes on. How long has Mark been sitting and looking at me? About two hours, I think, Sandy replied, grinning. He wasn't watching you all the time. His gaze wandered over me every now and then. I couldn't be mad at him after he tried so hard to save your life. I'm not complaining, Sarah insisted. I'm just wondering how we end up in such strange situations. Is it possible to wrap yourself in something warm and get some sleep? I can barely keep my eyes open. Is it okay if we get into your bed, Mark? Sandy asked. Sarah can sleep but I'll have to wake her up every few hours to check her mental state. Do you happen to have any pajamas we could wear? Actually, I don't have pajamas, 
but I have shorts and sweatpants. My t-shirts will be too big, but you've already slept in one of them. I'll bring them. Sandy and Sarah spent the next ten hours in Mark's bed. Sandy woke Sarah up twice to check on her, but was confident that she was recovering as well as could be expected. When they finally woke up, it was already two o'clock in the afternoon, and the storm had subsided. When Mark took his sisters home, their mother demanded that he come into their house, drink coffee, and eat a piece of pie. Mark, my wife and daughters will kill me if I don't apologize to you for being a little rude when we first met, William Phillips told Mark. What you did for Sandy and Sarah last night is something I will never forget or be able to repay. Just know that I'm so damn grateful to you. When it was time to leave, Sandy walked Mark to the door. You are a good person, Mark. I knew you would help me when I called you. And you did it. Thanks for everything. Can I call you sometime, Sandy? I don't know why I made you so angry. But this time, I will try to do everything right. I actually don't think that would be a good idea, Mark. I appreciate everything you've done for us more than you can imagine. But I really don't think I can spend any more time with you. I can't change my feelings. Mark was completely confused, but Sandy's final refusal of any communication with him forced him to come to terms with the situation. He nodded and left Sandy standing on the porch. This man is in a little pain, Sandy's mother said. Are you sure he has other girls? He seems so sincere. He's a real salesman, Mom. He could sell ice to Eskimos, Sandy joked. That doesn't make him trustworthy. It looked like you trusted him when we were both naked in his bathroom, Sarah noted. Will you trust him with your life but not your heart? Winter has finally died down. The local chamber has scheduled its annual awards for April. Mrs. Haynes was chairman of the awards committee and used the power of her office as she saw fit. Grandma, insisting that I give Mark the Small Business of the Year award is just petty and cruel. It won't make me suddenly accept the way he treated me. He and I will just end up in an awkward situation, Sandy complained. I want to be noticed and recognized in business circles, and this is one of the most visible ways to achieve this, Mrs. Haynes explained. You're making more out of this than it really is. Just ask a few questions to get him to speak freely. Over the years of work, we have become convinced that most businessmen make very lousy speeches. They either try to sell their product to everyone present, or they simply say, thank you, and sit down. By asking a few questions from the list you have, Mark will have the opportunity to explain what his business is and how it works. The two of you may be going through a difficult time, but that's no reason not to be professional. Difficult period? Grandma, we're not even friends, Sandy replied. This is a huge gap, not a crack. I consider him a bore and a liar. Yes, except when the situation is critical and you need a guy with character, ability, and endurance to help you get out of a difficult situation, said Mrs. Haynes. She couldn't talk her grandmother out of presenting her with the award at the house's annual dinner, but Sandy came up with a way to teach Mark a much-needed lesson. Mark knew that winning the Small Business of the Year award would benefit his business. He will be able to use it to promote himself and his position in society. His roots came from sales, and he understood that good press always helps make a sale. The problem is that the letter he received said that Miss Sandra Phillips would be presenting the award. She practically demanded that he leave her alone, and he obeyed her wishes. However, that didn't mean he didn't think about her often. It hurt him that she thought he was so reprehensible without even knowing why. His parents insisted that he go to dinner and graciously accept the award. He reserved two tables for the presentation. Five of his employees attended the dinner with their significant other, as well as his parents, sister, and Brittany. Mark's group took their seats as the formalities began. There were many speeches and confessions. Mark appreciated how the person presenting the award engaged the recipient in conversation, asking general questions about the business and the reasons for its success. It was much more interesting than the usual speech, in which the recipient thanked his mother, fate, and staff. Seeing how smoothly the system worked, Mark began to relax. All he needs is to answer a few questions about how and when he started his business, what he does, and why it works so well. He was confident that he had answers to any reasonable question. He has it. Mrs. Haynes took the podium to introduce her granddaughter, 
who would lead the closing presentation. Sandy graciously took over the role and began reading out the qualifications needed to receive the prestigious Small Business of the Year Award. Mark felt confident and calm, at least until Brittany whispered to him, I saw this woman. I don't remember where, but I will remember. There seems to be something wrong here. This year's Small Business of the Year winner is Reynolds Restoration, Sandy announced, to sustained applause. The founder and owner of the company is Mark Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds, please stand up. Mark stood up and Sandy continued. Mr. Reynolds, could you tell everyone what your company does? Mark smiled as he talked about the virtues of his small company. Sandy asked a few more soft questions before things got interesting. Could you, Mr. Reynolds, take a moment to introduce your family members and employees sitting at your desks? It's always nice to get to know the people who helped a company become successful. Mark hadn't heard anyone else ask this question, but he thought it was a worthy idea. His guys deserve recognition. He asked everyone to stand as he introduced him. When Brittany stood up, he introduced her as Brittany Roberts, and then turned to his mother, who was next in line. Just a minute, Mr. Reynolds, Sandy interrupted. You didn't mention how Miss Roberts relates to your family or business. Could you tell us more why such an attractive woman would be at your table if she is not your employee or family member? It should be something special to you. She was in the restaurant, Brittany whispered loudly, remembering the woman who had walked away in a clearly upset state. Brittany tried to determine what it was that was bothering the woman so much. What was the conversation about that day? This woman is in love with you, Brittany said loudly to Mark. It's as obvious as the nose on her face, pardon the expression. Sandy easily heard Brittany's comment and felt challenged by the beautiful woman. Not all of us can be supermodels with perfect faces and bodies. Some of us have to work to get ours. By this time, Brittany had already completed the puzzle. This is the same woman that Mark had been yearning for all spring. She left him because she thought Brittany was sleeping with Mark and hoping to marry him. Mark didn't know. Miss Phillips, you have already succeeded in achieving your main goal, Brittany announced, addressing the audience. Mark walks like a zombie in unrequited love. Mark's brother, however, thinks I'm absolutely gorgeous, and that makes me very happy. He proposed to me and is coming home with a ring next week. Do you want to know something? I'm going to reward his love for me in every way I can think of. He deserves it. I will be proud to be Mrs. Brittany Reynolds, wife of Jeff Reynolds, he is an active-duty U.S. Marine. Mark considers you the most beautiful on the planet. So what do you do about it? You broke his heart. I heard how he did everything he could to help you and your sister during the big snowstorm last winter. If your goal is to somehow confuse or offend him, I will stand against you. Mark and Jeff are as close as only two brothers can be. Anyone who stands against Mark will be against Jeff and me. Sandy was stunned by the blonde's revelations. She went to Hawaii to see Mark's brother. Mark didn't sleep with her. She said Mark thought Sandy was beautiful. The idea of making Mark admit that he is a two-faced boor failed completely. Mr. Reynolds, I apologize for my behavior this evening. I've crossed all boundaries. Congratulations on your well-deserved award, Sandy stammered before taking a step towards her seat. Just a minute. Mark's words made Sandy stop and turn to face him. You asked me several questions. Wouldn't it be fair if I gave you a couple too? Sandy nodded and walked over to the microphone. Yes, I apologize again. What questions do you have? Miss Phillips, do you love me or not? Mark demanded. All the spectators gasped in unison when they heard Mark's question. A smile appeared on Mark's mother's face, and Sarah and her mother were delighted. That's actually not a question that's asked at events like this, Sandy began. Miss Phillips, do you love me? Mark demanded again. So your revenge is to make me look like a fool. Do you want to humiliate me in public? I'll play along with you, Sandy said. I deserved it, didn't I? Mark stared at Sandy as she prepared to answer. She stared at him in response. To answer your question, bastard, I am hopelessly in love with you. I have never experienced anything like this before. I acted like a stupid schoolgirl and sent you away. Does this answer make you happy? Actually, yes. 
I have one more question, and then I'll stop tormenting you, Mark said nervously. This must be good, Sandy practically sobbed. What else do you want from me? One more question, and I'll leave. I didn't come here to flaunt my weaknesses in front of hundreds of business partners. I'll answer one more question, and then we'll be done with this. Okay, Mark agreed. Sandy Phillips, I love you more than I ever thought possible. Do you agree to become my wife? Sandy reeled at Mark's comment and question. Suddenly she felt dizzy. Sarah noticed her difficulty and rushed to her side to support her. Sis, Sarah said into the microphone, Mark and a hundred other people are waiting for your answer. Do you need time to think about it? I will marry you and be your wife with pleasure. This should be as clear to you as those huge breasts that adorn the chest of your future daughter-in-law, Sandy said to the laughter and applause of the audience. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.